most everyone, monks excluded of course, is living life in a way that pursues, pursues these goals. They want to fall in love, get married, have children, and live a happy family life. They want to learn a profession so that they can earn a good living and provide for their family a home and all the possessions that are needed. In this regard, Hindus are the same as everyone else, not at all different in fulfilling these natural human pursuits. Next, we have Dharma. While Dharma is a goal in its own right, it is also the guiding principle of the other three, as it defines the proper way to pursue wealth, pleasure, and liberation. Do we acquire wealth in a virtuous and honest way? Are spouses faithful to one another or not? If the answer is yes, then we are following Dharma. In addition to the idea of following virtue, Dharma outlines our natural human duties in life. We have obligations to our immediate family members, guests in our home, our parents, our community, our state, and our nation. Dharma tells us that we should help others perform our part in the service and upliftment of society. Dharma also includes the concept of regularly worshiping God. There is a verse from the Hindu scripture, Tirukkural, which nicely summarizes these duties. The foremost duty of family life is to serve duly these five. God, yes, kindred, ancestors, and oneself. Dharma can also be translated as religion, and we can clearly see that Hindus pursuing Dharma are similar to anyone else who is following a religious tradition. Finally, we have the goal of moksha, or liberation. All religions have a final goal. Some call it salvation. Others call it enlightenment. Hinduism calls it moksha, liberation, which refers to being liberated from the cycle of reincarnation on earth. Moksha occurs after karma has been resolved and realization of God has been attained. The three goals of dharma, artha, and kama are not ends in themselves but they do provide the environment and experiences which help the embodied soul mature over many lives and attain an ever-deepening God consciousness. This God consciousness eventually culminates in moksha, in which the soul is liberated from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. The desire for moksha only comes after a soul has pursued and been successful in fulfilling dharma, artha, and kama for numerous lives, so that it is no longer attached to worldly joys or sorrows. Said another way, those who renounce the world in this life in one point in pursuit of moksha do so having achieved worldly success and fulfillment in past lives. We can see that the Hindu concept of moksha is quite different from that held in religions such as Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, which believe in one life after which you go to heaven if you have accepted their beliefs and acted virtuously. However, it is similar to that held in other Eastern religions, such as Buddhism, Sikhism, and Jainism, in that profound spiritual experiences achieved on earth are necessary for liberation. Belief and good conduct are not enough. In concluding this section, let me add a few thoughts on success. In today's material world, success in life is popularly measured by looking solely at people's professional and family life. Do they have a good, well-paying job and a large home with a highly educated spouse and intelligent children? If the answer is yes, then they are considered to be successful. Parents are naturally focused on making sure their children are as successful in life as possible, which is good. However, unfortunately, we know some Hindu parents who strongly feel that their children's participation in Hindu religious activities and studies is a complete waste of time, meaning that it contributes nothing at all to their becoming successful. However, success is not simply having money. It is also the wise use of that money to benefit the community through acts of charity. 
It is also the honor given to a family that shows the qualities of honesty, generosity, and piety. And it is certain that enduring happiness does not come from possessing wealth. It comes from within, from our soul, and it is the service-oriented, devotional, and meditative practices of Hinduism that help us experience that happiness throughout our life. It is important that this broader meaning of success is understood that includes good character, charity, and enduring happiness, all of which come from the study and practice of Hinduism. Our second topic answers the questions, to Hindus, what is the purpose of life? The Hindu view of life is that we are a divine being, a soul who experiences many lives on earth, and that the purpose of our being here is spiritual unfoldment. Over a period of many lives, we gradually become a more spiritual being and are thus able to experience spiritual consciousness more deeply. This eventually leads to a profound experience in God consciousness, which brings to a conclusion our pattern of reincarnation on earth. This is called moksha, liberation. A great lady saint of North India, Ananda Maima, stated the goal of God realization quite beautifully. Man is a human being only so much as he aspires to self-realization. This is what human birth is meant for. To realize that one is the supreme duty of every human being. The Hindu view of life is, the, is that we are a divine being, a soul who experiences many lives on earth, and that the purpose of our being here is spiritual unfoldment. Over a period of many lives, we gradually become a more spiritual being and are thus able to experience spiritual consciousness more deeply. This eventually leads to liberation. Throughout the world today, many who are on the mystical path want to have a personal spiritual experience. They want to see God. Hinduism not only gives them the hope that they can achieve their goal in this lifetime, but it gives them the practical tools its many spiritual disciplines of service, devotion, and meditation through which this goal eventually becomes a reality. The focus of many religions is on helping those who do not believe in God to believe in God. Belief in God in such faith is the beginning and the end of the process. Once you believe in God, there is nothing more to do. However, in Hinduism, belief is only the first step Hindus want to move beyond believing in God to experiencing God. To the Hindu, belief is but a preparatory step to divine daily communion and life-transforming personal realization. There's a story I tell on about this, which is the classic story of Swami Vivekananda. Some of you may have heard this story. When he was a young man, uh, just out of the university, Calcutta, and uh, he does what those sometimes freshmen at the university do, they give spiritual leaders a hard time. They ask them very difficult questions. Sometimes that happens to me as well. And uh, so as Swamiji uh, was doing that, he was going around visiting all the uh, eminent spiritual leaders in the Calcutta area and asking them the direct question, have you seen God? Well, that's a very direct question. He didn't get a satisfactory answer. He kept asking and asking and asking until he met Ramakrishna. And so one day he met Ramakrishna and he asked Ramakrishna that question. Sir, have you seen God? And Ramakrishna's answer is this. Yes, I see him as clearly as one sees an apple in the palm of the hand. Nay, even more intently. And not only this, you can also see him. So this answer was a good answer and deeply impressed the young Vivekananda who soon after accepted Sri Ramakrishna as his guru. As was mentioned in the introduction, 
my guru's guru, Sat Yoga Swami, Sat Guru Yoga Swami of Jaffna, Sri Lanka, was a great yogi. And he would sit for hours, even days, in deepest meditation. He would also stress the importance of meditation to his devotees and formulated a key teaching, or Mahavakyam, to help them meditate. Tannai Bhavi. Know thyself. Here are some of Yoga Swami's sayings on knowing thyself. You must know the self by the self. Concentration of mind is required for this. You lack nothing. The only thing you lack is that you do not know who you are. Truth is not encompassed by books and learning. You must know yourself by yourself. There is nothing else to be known. My guru began taking his monks to Jaffa in 1969. Yoga Swami, of course, had passed away in 1964, so we did not have the opportunity of meeting him personally. However, Yoga Swami's disciple, Markandu Swami, was living in a hut outside of Jaffa and would share Yoga Swami's teaching with all who visited. In this way, many of our senior monks had the opportunity to visit him and listen to his explanation of Yoga Swami's teaching. Mark and his Swami like to stress the teaching that Yoga Swami only gave us one work to do. He would say, Yoga Swami didn't give us a hundred odd works to do, only one. Realize the self, yourself, or know thyself, or find out who you are. In Paulo, Tanai Ani, you can't find the truth in a thousand books, or by listening to people talk. You must realize the self by yourself. What exactly does it mean to know thyself? Sivi Yoga Swami explains this beautifully in one of his published letters called non Yama. Who am I? You are not the body. You are not the mind, nor the intellect, nor the will. You are the Atma, the self. The Atma is eternal. This is the conclusion at which great souls have arrived from their experience. Let this truth become well impressed on your mind. Yoga Swami is pointing out that many people think they are the body. How they look is who they are. Others identify with the emotions and memories of the mind. And still others think they are the intellect the reasoning part of the mind and the willpower to successfully accomplish their plans. Today we are deluged by information. Books, television, and the internet provide us with much more information than ever available before. We are in fact in technology's information age. Unfortunately, though information abounds, how much of it is teaching us that we are a divine soul? Certainly, only a very small amount. Clearly, most of the information in our modern world teaches us to identify with our external nature. Movies and TV teach us we are our body and emotions. And in school, we are taught we are our intellect. What this Swami is saying is that it's not in books, you fool. However, for today's world, we need to expand his saying to read, it's not in books television, movies, the internet, or computer games, you fool. Identifying with our spiritual nature and deepening our experience of God again comes from a proper understanding of and practice of Hinduism. Our third topic is practical in nature. It focuses on the perspectives and practices that can help us spiritualize daily life. So a common experience I have in talking with guests and our Kauai Hali now is the idea that's expressed as follows. Maybe you've heard this idea or maybe you've felt this by yourself. It goes something like this. Swami, we're so busy in life, you know, with our, our jobs, raising our children, uh, doing other things. We have very little time left over for our spiritual life. We're so sorry not putting in more time in our spiritual life, what can we do? Do you have any advice? Sound familiar? Ever thought that? Ever heard that? 
So what's wrong with that concept? This is based on the perspective that work and worship are totally separate. Worship is what is done in the temple and shrine room. Work is what is done in the fields, the factory, or the office. The attitude is we are working to earn money to support ourselves. We are worshiping to receive the blessings of the gods. The two realms are unrelated when we view it in this way. The separation of work and worship is a Western perspective, not a Hindu one. In Western thinking, this idea of a separation goes to the extreme on the idea of a holy day, the Sabbath, which is Sunday. Sunday is a common Sabbath, but not all uh, Western religions observe Sunday. But they observe one day a week, which is the religious day, and that's the day in which you worship. And the other six days, you don't worship, you work. So they're creating a division between work and worship. Hinduism, however, has no such division of life into sacred and secular. All of life is a time when we can make spiritual progress, no matter where we are. If we're in the temple, if we're at work, if we're at school, if we're at home, we can make spiritual progress if we give it some thought. Our Parama Guru Yogaswami spoke of this perspective on many occasions. One of the statements is, the world is an ashram, a training ground for the achievement of moksha, liberation. Let's look more closely at what it means to say that all the world is an ashram. That ashram, of course, is the residence and teaching center of a swami or spiritual preceptor. It is a place we go to learn about our religion, and make spiritual progress. <coughs> when we go out the door of our home, to go to work, school, or elsewhere, do we have in mind that we are going to an ashram? That our actions during the day, in the office, factory, hospital, classroom, or elsewhere, will help us evolve spiritually and bring us closer to moksha? Probably not. When we come home and reflect back on the day, do we feel we made spiritual progress while out of the home? Probably not. Why is this? It is because we have not been trained to look at life in this way. We think of the ashram as a place of spiritual advancement, and we regard the world as a place of mundane tasks and distractions from our spiritual work. Common ideas of what we do in the ashram, the home shrine or the temple, is what brings us spiritual progress and to what we do in the office or in the classroom has nothing to do with our spiritual life. This common perspective is not the viewpoint of great souls such as Yogaswami. Such souls know that much spiritual progress can be made during our time in the world if we hold the right perspective. I call this approach spiritualizing daily life. Let's bring this concept down to earth by dividing the occasions for spiritual progress when out of the world into two categories. Facing life's challenges and finding opportunities to serve. First, let's look at facing life's challenges. Life is going to come to you whether you want it to or not. Joyful, easy times, difficult times, happy days and sad. It is all coming. It is all there in your karma. It can't help but come. So you don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to go try and do something different. You can't avoid it. You can't even hide from it. Life's challenges to, will come to us. What is going to happen is going to happen. But where the focus should be for those on the spiritual path is how we respond to these challenges. Why? Because that is where we have a choice. For example, a small infant keeps us awake all night by crying. How do we respond to it? Does it upset us? Do we complain? Or do we just accept it and respond back with lots of love? In every experience of life, we have control over our response. It can be impulsive or thoughtful. The choice is ours. When accused of something that we didn't do, how do we respond? When we face challenges at work, Say our boss is unfair with us, yells at us, what is our reaction? We want to yell back, but cannot. So do we go home and yell at the spouse? In all such cases, we have choices. 
It is not the challenges that come, but how we face those challenges that makes the difference. We can react emotionally without thinking about spiritual principles. We can get angry or despondent. We can worry a lot and become irritable. Or we can decide to control any emotional reactions that we might have. We can choose to live without anger. We can choose to cultivate patience. We can choose to be kinder to other people, to be more generous. That is what makes us spiritually stronger. As we curb our instinctive nature, our soul nature shines forth. In other words, if we get angry now and then, let us try and eliminate anger altogether. If we get impatient with people who seem to explain things at great lengths when they could be explained in a short way, let's learn how not to get impatient. Let us learn how to accept that verbosity is their nature. Here is a list of six common challenges we face in life that provide us with good opportunities for spiritual progress if we respond in a wise manner with self-control. First challenge. Mistreatment by others. Mistreatment by others. Life provides us a steady stream of experiences in which we are mistreated by others. Rather than retaliate or hold resentment, we can forgive and respond with kindness. Second challenge, our own mistakes. When we make a major error, we have a choice to wallow in self-doubt and self-deprecation or to figure out how to not repeat the mistake. Third challenge, difficult projects. When faced with tasks that stretch our abilities, we can do the minimal just to get by, or be inspired to do our best by looking at them as opportunities to improve our concentration, willpower, and steadfastness, all of which will enhance our meditation abilities and inner striving. Fourth challenge, disturbed emotions. When we get upset by life's experiences, we have a choice to suffer the emotional upheaval or to strive to pull ourselves out of it as quickly as possible. Fifth challenge, interpersonal conflicts. When serious disagreements, quarrels, or arguments occur, we have a choice to hold a grudge and perhaps even shun the person or to resolve the matter and keep the relationship harmonious. Sixth challenge, gossip and backbiting. When those around us indulge in gossip, rumors, scandals, and backbiting, we have a choice to join in or to not participate, and even among those close to us, make it clear that we do not approve. The second category of occasions for spiritual progress when out in the world is what I call finding opportunities to serve. Here's an introduction to this concept from Gurudeva's book, Living with Shiva, which beautifully illustrates the idea of spiritualizing daily life through service. Quote, go out into the world this week and let your light shine through your kind thoughts, but let each thought manifest itself in a physical deed of doing something for someone else. Lift their burdens just a little bit, and unknowingly perhaps, you may lift something that is burdening your mind. You erase and wipe clean the mirror of your own mind through helping another. We call this karma yoga, the deep practice of unwinding through service the selfish, self-centered, egotistical vasanas or subconscious inclinations of the lower nature that have been generated for many, many lives and which bind the soul in darkness. Through service and kindness, you can unwind the subconscious mind and gain a clear understanding of all laws of life. Your soul will shine forth. You will be that peace. You will radiate that inner happiness and be truly secure simply by practicing being kind in thought, word, and deed. There are many opportunities to help others at home, work, school, in the neighborhood and community. We have developed a list of six simple practices. Let me briefly introduce them. First opportunity, seeing God in those we greet. When greeting 
meeting someone, we strive to look deeply enough into them to see God, to see them as a divine being evolving through experience into oneness with God. When we see God in another individual, our attitude toward them is then naturally helpful and benevolent. Second opportunity, volunteering. There are many opportunities each day to step forward and offer to help in ways that are beyond what is required of us. An attitude of humble service distinguishes the ego. An attitude of humble service diminishes the ego and strengthens our spiritual identity. One important spiritual attitude to hold is to be willing to help when called upon, to not resist or refuse, to be as open to helping others as you are in doing things. Third opportunity, expressing appreciation. We can uplift and encourage others by sincerely expressing how grateful we are for their help, friendship, and importance in our life. Fourth opportunity, helping newcomers. In our modern world, people move around a great deal. Thus, there is a steady flow of newcomers at work, at school, in our neighborhood, and at our temple. Stepping forward to welcome and help orient them to their new environment is an excellent way to be of service. Fifth opportunity, offering hospitality. Everyone can find creative ways to be hospitable in the home, at school, and even at work. Sixth and last opportunity, making encouraging and complimentary remarks. Make a point to say something encouraging and complimentary to everyone you meet. Their day will be brighter because of it, and so will yours. In conclusion, having a great day needs to mean more than getting a bonus at work or an A on a school test. It should include the spiritual progress you made that day through effectively facing life's challenges and the ways in which you helped and uplifted others. Our list of 12 practices is a good beginning, but hopefully you will keep expanding it as additional insights come from your striving to maximize the spiritual progress you can make from the experiences and opportunities each day brings. Also, parents can teach children to consciously strive for spiritual progress each day at school by finding, by facing life challenges and finding opportunities to serve. And our last comment on the relevance of Hinduism to modern society is threefold. Firstly, Hinduism provides us with a concept of success that is broader than just love and wealth, but includes good character, honor, and most importantly, achieving inner and enduring happiness. Secondly, at a deeper level, Hinduism tells us that the ultimate purpose of life is spiritual advancement. Therefore, it is important to encompass spiritual practices every day of our life. Thirdly, Hinduism provides us an abundance of practices we can incorporate into our daily life to maximize our spiritual progress 